T-minus 15, 14, 13, T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, this is high-speed ignition of the, the uh, three main engines. Look at those babies come up to speed. Watch this is the cockpit. Shows how the vehicle moves back and forth there. And this is high-speed photography of the bolts blowing and the solid rocket motors lighting off. And all that this uh, water spray right there where they're trying to keep things cool and not having much luck. And this is very high-speed photography. Just when it lit off, there was a couple of thumps and we started moving up very slowly. Look at these beautiful shocks coming out of the main engine. It lift off and it's moving a lot faster than that. This shows how close it comes to the intertack access arm, which has always worried me some. It's really getting up and going. John and I expected a real hard kick in the pants. Uh, there shows that what it looked like out John's window. Call power and clear right from the cockpit. There's actually a really very smooth lift off with very little shaking associated with it. In 1971, the need for lower-cost transportation into space on a routine basis was recognized. NASA was given the charter by the President and by Congress to design and build a reusable space shuttle. It's called the reusable space shuttle. Taking off like a rocket and landing like an airplane, it will virtually replace the way we transport manned and unmanned spacecraft into orbit by the early 1980s. To prepare for the shuttle, research and development programs continued to move ahead as high-speed wind tunnels were used to help solve the problems of re-entry. Here, undergoing tests, are special recoverable booster rockets that will be retrieved after launch. Other engineers prepare to make shuttle vibration studies, finding out where the stress areas are. At NASA's Flight Research Center in California, the X-24B lifting body was airdropped several times. The X-24 is developing maneuvering and landing capabilities for future aerospace vehicles like the Space Shuttle. This research pilot is simulating a landing of the reusable Space Shuttle. The shuttle is a cargo-carrying combination, spacecraft and aircraft, able to carry large payloads to and from Earth and space 100 times or more. It's scheduled for use in the early 1980s. Here, the emphasis is on simulating terminal area energy management. That is, making the transition from atmospheric re-entry to the landing approach phase. 3,000 uh, miles range to go. CRT displays look good. And simulating orbiter approach and landing. What we learn here directly affects the design of orbiter onboard systems. One of the men who'd like to fly the shuttle is astronaut Joe Engel. Here at the Space Division of Rockwell International in California, he describes a full-scale mock-up of the big craft. What we think of as the airplane part of the shuttle, which is what you see right behind me, is 122 feet long. That's about the same size as a DC-9. It has a wingspan of 88 feet. And probably it's a little bigger around than a normal cargo-carrying airplane. It's called Enterprise, first of the Space Shuttle orbiters. Five times, two astronauts were carried piggyback atop this 747 jet and released. Five times, they brought the huge spaceship in for powerless landings. Okay, the gear is coming down at 270. Here coming. Doors open and they're all down. Coming down. Look down here. 50 feet. 40 feet. 30. 20. Okay. 10. Holding 10. 220 is about 5 feet. Astronaut Gordon Fullerton. We're at the end of the approach and landing test phase of this program, but it's it's really not an end. It's a beginning. It's uh, just a small step, uh, really accomplished toward getting the orbiter into space, and then in that aspect, uh, 
I'm looking forward to uh, more of the same exciting times uh, as we continue on toward that first orbital flight. I feel like we have one enterprise that was fantasy, but now we've got the real enterprise. Well, this, this enterprise is half real and half fantasy. Why don't you have a seat over here in the commander's side, wow, it Michelle? it looks just like my enterprise. Yeah, it does kind of. Well, I'll tell you what it does look like. It looks pretty much like the real shuttle orbiter. Captain, <laughs> <What? laughs> at last. <laughs> Since you're sitting in the commander's seat, Michelle, let me show you how you might fly it if we were in space. Oh, boy. Huh? Between your knees there is what we call the hand controller, the rotation controller. It operates just like a conventional airplane stick. And if you pull back uh, on the stick or the hand controller, yeah. uh, it'll raise the nose of the orbiter. Oh, yeah. And then if you push forward, it'll lower the nose. If you wanted to bank left for a left turn, you'd push the can controller left, just like a regular old airplane. <laughs> oh, it really is. One thing that's different about this vehicle is you notice we've got some what we call cathode ray tube displays. we got three of them. You don't see those in conventional airplanes uh, because the need to display a variety of information with limited space isn't quite so critical as here. Enterprise will not be the first shuttle into space, but this one will be. Shown here being assembled by Rockwell International, it is simply designated Orbiter 102. 102 is undergoing construction right now in Palmdale, and it's scheduled to be shipped uh, the middle of next year over to DFRC, where we'll uh, perform a hot fire test on it. We will mate it to the 747 and fly it to Florida in preparation for launch into orbit in March of 1979. Uh, after about 24 hours in orbit on 102, it also will land here at DFRC on the lake bed in the manner similar to the uh, test flights that we've just completed on the approach and landing test. 47-year-old John Young, veteran of two Gemini and two Apollo space flights, will be commander for the first manned shuttle mission. Here, he practices making landings in a space shuttle simulator at the Johnson Space Center with Robert Crippen, the 40-year-old astronaut who will fly with Young as pilot. Work is continuing on the second shuttle orbiter at the Rockwell plant in California. This is the spacecraft that will actually make the first flight with astronauts Young and Crippen at the controls. The three main engines that will power the space shuttle into orbit were tested at the National Space Technology Laboratory in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. The main engines are designed to produce up to 470,000 pounds of thrust, gulping a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. Problems in testing the shuttle engines continue to cause delays. Small rocket engines called thrusters that make it possible to maneuver the shuttle once in space were also successfully fired at NASA's White Sands test facility in New Mexico. The 154-foot external propellant tank that will hold 1,550,000 pounds of fuel for the shuttle's three main engines was rolled out and shipped to the Kennedy Space Center, Florida. The external tank was manufactured at NASA's Michoud assembly facility by the Martin Marietta Company. This is Space Shuttle Orbiter 102, christened Columbia. It was named for the seagoing Columbia out of Boston that entered and explored the mouth of the Columbia River in 1792. Captain Robert Gray named the river after his ship. It will be the Space Shuttle Columbia that makes the first trip into orbit around the Earth. The 122-foot-long spaceship, which looks like and lands like an airplane, is being molded into existence by a government industry team of engineers and technicians. 31,000 specially made silica tiles are being mounted on the surface of Columbia, making it possible for the shuttle to withstand repeated heating and cooling. Good for 100 or more round trips into space without replacement. Problems encountered in installing the protective tiles have contributed to pushing back the first shuttle launch by several months. Despite some troublesome delays along the way, all the parts and pieces of the new space transportation system are coming together and approaching launch readiness. Work on NASA's reusable space transportation system continued at many levels in preparation for the upcoming first launch. The shuttle orbiter's main engines have successfully passed firing tests, singly and clustered in a group of three. They too are ready for launch. Installation of thermal tiles that protect the spacecraft from heat buildup during re-entry are now in place and ready for the flight. 
This is how the entire space transportation system will look. The airplane-like orbiter is attached to the main fuel tank with the two solid rocket boosters on each side. The crew is having breakfast at this time. They're having a traditional breakfast of orange juice, steak, eggs, toast, and coffee. And a go has been given for them to move to the suiting room. John Young and Bob Crippen are walking out of the breakfast area now on their way to the suiting room. The commander, John Young. Young has already been in space four times for a total of 533 hours. And uh, there's me, and uh, you can see my big project the week before flight was uh, getting uh, bigger United States flags put on our pressure suits. Uh, this shows Bob Crippen uh, getting ready to fly. The pilot, Robert Crippen. Although Crippen has over 4,000 hours of jet aircraft flying time, this will be his first time in space. This shows us uh, in the van, the traditional van that's been carrying Apollo crews out uh, that we rode out going into the white room of the vehicle. The crew is now moving across the uh, swing arm, the orbiter access arm, toward the white room, the, the very clean area uh, in which they will be uh, prepared for entry into the orbiter. Everybody had to wear those little masks, theoretically, for our last week there so that uh, we wouldn't contaminate them or something. They found it. Nobody at the Cape got sick from us being around us. <laughs> This is uh, shutting up the hatch uh, just prior to launch, and that's a John said it gets kind of lonely out there. At the launch control center, three miles from the pad, final steps are being completed in the countdown. Final preparations are also being made in the mission control center in Houston, where control of the flight will switch once the shuttle clears the tower. 2,700 photographers, film, and television crews plus newspaper and magazine writers from around the world are here to cover the launch. Approximately 600,000 spectators line the coastal area near the Kennedy Space Center. Launch for redundant at sequencer start, minus 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15, 14, 13. T minus 10, 9, Eight, seven. The vibration in the cockpit was very low at this time uh, after the engines light off. Just when it lit off, there was a couple of thumps and we started moving up very slowly. Here shows that what it looked like out John's window. Call tower clear right from the cockpit. There's actually a really very smooth liftoff with very little shaking associated with it. There's the road program to head us out over the ocean. And the vehicle is, uh, the cockpit vibration is such that you can still read all your instruments in there in uh, maybe it's uh, maybe 10 cycles per second. And this shows the vehicle speed uh, picking up. It's probably about ready to go supersonic right now, almost going straight up. And uh, we said that's what it's going to do, but I didn't really believe it would, but it did. The ride was, was very smooth throughout this, up in the uh, transonic phase. It shook just a little bit. They're coming through max Q. Roger. Columbia, Houston, you're going throttle up. Roger, going throttle up. Roger, Columbia, on the nice ride. You're lofting a little bit, so you'll probably be slightly high at staging. We were uh, getting a little lost on our trajectory here that we're still analyzing right now. Also, I was seeing some debris coming off uh, from up over the nose that was coming back and uh, hitting the windscreen and going over the top of the vehicle. That uh, We weren't sure what it is. Uh, like ice or soapy, uh, that's the stuff on the external tank that they're still analyzing. I believe that tail is about uh, 750 feet long, and maybe uh, you can see it better from here. Uh, maybe six, 700 feet long, maybe uh, 150, 200 feet wide. 
It's really impressive. I'm glad we couldn't see that. <laughs> Thank goodness for no rearview mirror. One minute, 45 seconds, coming up on go, no, go. Columbia, your negative seat. Uh, that call up says uh, that uh, Columbia has the altitude is too high for ejection seat use. Mark. Columbia, your go for SRB step. Two minutes, four seconds, standing by for SRB. This is a, a camera from the ET doors and shows a solid rocket motor separation. We show it again from inside the cabin, although the light is much brighter than this. The big flash across the windscreen. Isn't that a spectacular shot? Two minutes, 20 seconds, confirmed solid rocket motor. From onboard sensations, the only thing we really saw was uh, the flash of light and our normal avionics cues that we had dumped the solid. We did not see them go away nor feel any jokes. We're less than 1G right after separation transfer G's, and this baby's just chugging along, and it's just as smooth as glass that ride is. Columbia now 74 nautical miles in altitude, 181 nautical miles down. Phenomenal there, man. What a view, what a view. Here you see some particles coming by John's window, uh, a couple of white objects. There weren't one that uh, was indicative of the kind of stuff that we've been seeing uh, throughout the uh, flight. Two nautical miles down range. Velocity now reading 11,000 feet per second. Mark 8 minutes, 15 seconds. Columbia now 63 nautical miles in altitude, 650 nautical miles down range. Standing by now for main engine cutoff. This is uh, back in the, this is the umbilical separation back in that uh, view that we saw, and this is external tank separation, and it is a spectacular sight. That white particles you see there are ice uh, caused by the, the hydrogen freezing as it's coming out, perfectly nominal. There's the, uh, the fitting that goes up in the orbiter, there's the umbilical plate, and there's the tank, and as you can see, all this black material there, that's the way the soapy works, it chars and turns black, so it's a high heating area in there, and it really caught it, and there's another place that's sort of discolored up here toward the nose of the tank. So it's supposed to have been a tumble valve actuate to start uh, the vehicle tumbling, uh, and it did not work, and it, from our standpoint, it gave us a, a much better view of the tank. You'll also see the nose uh, discolored. It's got all the sophie gone from it because there's a, a sort of metallic color there, but that might be bright. Yeah, we're, we're not sure of that, and uh, people are analyzing that still. Shortly, by firing the OMS, orbital maneuvering system engines, Columbia will achieve orbit. Columbia, Houston, uh, we have 40 seconds to LOS. Configure LOS. You're looking good burning over the hill. We'll see you at Madrid. Roger. The Ohm's burns are successful. Columbia is now in orbit, circling the Earth at an altitude of approximately 150 miles. Right, if you have changed any, it's really something else. I tell you, John had been telling me about him for three years, but ain't no way you can describe it. The payload bay doors will now be open. Okay, the port door is coming open now. This uh, is two TV cameras uh, mucks together uh, one on the left and one on the right shows the initial payload bay door opening. Uh, all of that went, went nice and smooth. You'll notice uh, the Ohm's pod coming into view right here. This is the first time we saw some, uh, some tiles missing off of the Ohm's pod. You notice the door kind of hesitates when it opens, too. It did this in a fixture on the ground, and they told us, well, that was due to the fixture, the way the door really worked. The camera on the right is, is an aft camera looking forward. You can see the windows coming. The one on the uh, on the left is a forward camera looking aft. Uh, all those that door operations went uh, as smooth as it could be, which uh, I was mighty happy because I didn't particularly care about the thought of going outside and trying to trying to do anything associated with them. Well, you are missing one fantastic sight. Boy, that is really beautiful out there. Uh, we appreciate those updates. Both doors have been opened. The radiators can be deployed to begin dissipating the heat. The doors are all opened up and uh, hunky dory. This is a view, a pan in the outside that shows the radiators deployed out there. That's a beautiful, uh, beautiful shot with the t television. That's a deployed right on time. And the radiators look good. Okay, we uh, 
We want to show you our home spot here. We do have a, uh, a few tiles missing off of, uh, of both of them, uh, off of the uh, starboard pod, the three uh, tile and some smaller pieces, and off the port pod, uh, looks like I see one full square and uh, looks like a few little triangular shapes that are missing, and uh, we're uh, trying to put that on TV right now. Roger, Crip, we can see that good. Uh, from what we can see of both wings, uh, tops and uh, leading edges, though, there's, uh, all those are fully intact. At a news conference later in the day, Flight Director Neil Hutchison answers questions from reporters. Well, you asked me if I knew where there were any other tiles that might be loose. The answer is no. Uh, and quite frankly, we're not worried about any other tiles being loose. Uh, the phenomenon that uh, took them off, uh, and this is pure supposition at this time, gosh, you know, we're just now trying to regroup and understand what might have done it, but it's fairly obvious it probably was some kind of shock wave and ascent that we didn't anticipate, and uh, that's about all I can say. It's uh, in the same area on both sides, away from the tail and up on the top of the, near the front and up on the top of the pod. Uh, Jim, you have any other comments on what might have taken them off? No. <laughs> the, the question was, does the fact that, that some of them, when they sort of key together, does the fact that some are missing make others more vulnerable to coming sure. loose when you fire the engine no. repeatedly, as you will during the rest of the mission? Not when you fire the engine, no, sir. At this writing, is there anything, anything at all, that would lead you to say you might not go for a full duration mission? Nothing. Go all the way. Yes, sir. We're at three hours, 16 minutes mission elapsed time, and the uh, crew aboard Columbia has been given a go to uh, stay on orbit. Uh, this uh, provides them with the opportunity to uh, doff their suits. Spacecraft must go for on orbit. This thing is just performing, just outstanding. Uh, this is a scene of me uh, climbing out of the climbing out of the seat. Uh, all the operations associated with the suit and the seat while you're in zero G are, are much easier to handle than it is down here on Earth. I'm just stuffing the. Uh, the helmet and a, a little bag along with the glove so that we can, we can tuck them away. There's quite a few connections associated with that suit, but uh, it's no real problem to handle at all in zero G. In one G, we had a lot of problem with this helmet. It was always bumping into the hand controller and firing things there. You see it's up there out of the way. We finally got it right. That's a float snipely. And Columbia, Houston, uh, just for your information, uh, you dropped those SRVs right on target, and uh, they were floating just the way they ought to be, and uh, the boats were getting ready to fish them and bring them back. Okay. The uh, ride that they gave us was uh, pretty neat. After being towed back to Kennedy Space Center, both boosters will be refurbished and used again in a future shuttle flight. The third and fourth Ohms burns are also successful, raising Columbia's orbit to an altitude of approximately 172 miles. For the first television transmission from inside the spacecraft, the crew will give a status report on the mission. The flight so far has gone uh, uh, as smooth as it could possibly go. We've uh, done uh, every uh, test that we're supposed to do, and we're up on the timeline, and the vehicle has just been performing uh, performing beautifully, much better than anyone ever expected uh, to do on a first flight, and uh, no systems are out of shape. Uh, just an example, uh, we did uh, three uh, Star Tracker alignments in uh, less time than it takes to do one Star Tracker alignment, the Lish Simulator. Uh, all the RCS jets have been fired, and the vehicle is just performing like a champ. It's really beautiful. And uh, it's delightful up here at Zero Gravity, you might add. Of course, we owe this to a lot of people. There's uh, one in particular I'd like to pay uh, our respects to who, if he was here now, would uh, really be having a lot of fun. Uh, he was a man for the country, and there are many like him, Tiger Teague, I guess y'all all know him. And, uh, of course, there's many other people we can pay our respects to. If we start down the line of all the folks we owe, we'd be here till tomorrow. But uh, we 
certainly want to thank everyone who has helped get this thing airborne and uh, can take great pride in doing so well right now. This shows a camera forward in the cockpit looking aft and uh, with John coming out of the seat. Uh, this is actually some TV stuff that we did, so status reports. Pretty good indication of the kind of problems we have with some of our comm lines, which uh, you had to work pretty hard to make sure you didn't get tied up in those things. And we stayed tied up in them the whole flight. The government is now looking at wireless mics that I think will really improve the capability of the crew to operate. As you can see there, I'm having to hold mine uh, next to my mouth so I can talk to people. I'd like to echo John's words as I usually do. I guess uh, being the so-called rookie on this flight, I had a, a thrill from from the moment of liftoff all the way up to what we're doing now. It it's really been super. The spacecraft has worked as advertised all the way along. A uh, few little minor new problems, but uh, nothing of significance. I guess the major one you guys are working on down there is uh, dealing with some of our instrumentation. Uh, but uh, I think we've got something that's really going to mean something to the country and the world. This vehicle is uh, performing like a champ, like all of us that have worked so long on them knew, knew that you would. I've been looking forward to uh, landing in Edwards a couple days from now. And uh, unless you got some questions, Hank, I guess that does it. That was a good time, and I think you must have practiced. We're just about to lose your ghost song. I guess we owe you guys one super attaboy for today. I, this is fantastic. You worked through a pretty long, hard day, and you're essentially right on schedule, which I, is going to be close to being a first sort of space flight biz, I think, for first day activities. It's sure been fun working with you today, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the morning. I hope you get a good night's rest. Okay, you guys did super work today. See you manana. Roger, thank you. See you tomorrow, guys. Morning, Columbia. Welcome to day two. All right. This a good breakfast. Today, the astronauts will test onboard systems and also review procedures for tomorrow's landing. A test of the flight okay, control yeah. system is conducted by John Young. The flight control system operates Columbia's aero surfaces, the elevons, body flaps, rudder, and speed brake. These surfaces are useless in the vacuum of space, but will be essential tomorrow when the shuttle lands. This will require precision maneuverability, which the aero surfaces provide. This is uh, an ops. Uh, Mode 8, check out of the hand controller. You move it full throw and then you read on the cathode ray tube, which is where I'm looking, uh, to see if the hand controller is working properly. And this is very exciting. A little bit of this will last you about six months. <laughs> Payload bay door cycling tests help ensure that latching and closing procedures can also be done before entry tomorrow. As with every mission, many pictures of the Earth are taken by the astronauts. Over 500 on this first shuttle flight. After lunch on the second day, the astronauts receive a phone call from the Vice President of the United States, George Bush. How's it going up there? Everything rocking along all right? The ship is just performing beautifully. Well, it's great, and everybody views it, I'm sure, just as the forerunner of great things to come. I think your trip is just going to... Uh, ignite the excitement and the forward thinking from this country, so I really just wanted to call up and wish you the very best. We certainly appreciate it, Mr. Vice President. Thank you very much, sir. This is a shot down on our mid-deck storage area where we uh, had all of our stuff stowed, and uh, this was after the conversation we had with the Vice President. Well, the only bad part about it, Joe, is we're going to have to come down. Well, don't come down in that attitude. <laughs> oh, it's a pretty good attitude. Uh, zero G is something else. That is uh, yes. something that uh, all of you should have an opportunity down. to experience. Yeah. It is really fun. Oh, no, if you'd do that in your living room without breaking your leg, you sure would. There's no problem trying to restrain yourself anywhere down there. I'm uh, in the process here of changing out one of our Lyle canisters, which is used to uh, that we run the air through to take out all the CO2 and any contamination. It's a very easy job. We had a couple of troughs down there where we stow uh, Lyle canisters, and you could just put your legs down in there and kind of push them apart, and it restrains you very nicely. Look at this. Uh, just 
shows the mobility that we have down the mid deck. People thought we needed restraint systems to tie ourselves down in there. You don't need any of that. Now watch this mobility that Bob has when he kicks off and goes up uh, to the top side. Boy, I'll tell you, if that isn't the neatest thing in the world. The thing about it is you don't really go flying around. Uh, just, you need to move a little bit slowly, otherwise you'll end up banging into something, but uh, there's no problem controlling yourself any place you want to go. Try that, try that in one gravity and just, see where it gets you. You see, I just was wearing my socks there. I never put any shoes on while you're on orbit. I don't like to when I'm in the house either, so. On board, the astronauts suit up for entry. Columbia, you have a go for payload bay door closing. The doors, which have been open a total of 47 hours during the flight, must now be closed. Now we're coming up to the reason I was glad I was flying with a guy like John that's got all the experience. We're getting ready to come home and uh, sitting beside a man that knows space testing like he does made you feel mighty good. We're shutting the doors and all of that again went just like, uh, just like we wanted it to. It, uh, there were no problems at all associated with it. You can notice there's a little bit of jerky motion when it comes down. We were lowering the uh, starboard door down easy, and you'll notice it bounces pretty good, uh, which we're having to pass on to other following crews to make sure that when they close it, they can don't have any problem with overlap. Got her all tucked away, and we're ready to come home. Then, using the RCS thrusters, Columbia will maneuver into deorbit burn attitude, head down and backwards, fire the Ohms engines one last time, and descend into the Earth's atmosphere. John, we're all riding with you. Columbia is out of contact during the Ohm's burn. Should have acquisition in about uh, 10 seconds. We'll stand by. Columbia, this is Houston through Yargity. We're standing by. Burn was on time, but not long as is one Columbia is now committed to entry. With an RCS post-burn maneuver and several firings, it is oriented to a heads-up, nose-first attitude headed toward entry interface. This is where the atmosphere begins, at approximately 400,000 feet. Okay, John, copied, uh, From that moment the until the shuttle reaches 165,000 feet, it will be in communication blackout, out of touch with mission control for almost 20 minutes. And uh, you'll like to know that four chase aircraft have just launched from Eddie and coming up looking for you. Well, I'll be there in about 45 minutes. That's what they're hoping. When the shuttle touches down here, it will be traveling at 216 miles per hour. Right now it's going more than 17,000 miles per hour. Before it lands, it must slow down, lose energy, and it must survive the intense heat caused by traveling through the atmosphere at such a high rate of speed. Enormous crowds are also beginning to arrive. A string of traffic six miles long waits to enter the base. Thousands more are already here. Close to one half million people will eventually be on hand to see the landing. Several S-turns, or roll reversals, are used to slow down and maneuver Columbia through the atmosphere. And uh, there's the sunrise coming up. And we're moving along at about 300,000 feet, and we're just about to 265,000 feet where we go on our first roll reversal. And you'll see that pretty shortly. Now, we're moving pretty fast, but not quite this fast. <laughs> That's the first roll reversal. And here's the second roll reversal. It's done at Mach uh, 18 and a half, and this is at two frames a second. So we're moving six times faster than we would in the, in the real world. Twelve times, maybe, yeah. Mach 18 and a half, and you really see those clouds go by even in the real, in the real world, but it's not quite this fast. Hello, Houston, uh, Columbia. This is here. Columbia Houston's here. How do you read? And we're doing uh, Mach 10.3 at 180 AS. And we couldn't agree more, John. Your state vector's good. We've got a uh, good data in the The entry trajectory, velocity, and position look good. Columbia is heading for home, now only 470 miles away. Any more left out of CS, but okay. All right, we show me a roll. And John, we're showing you rolling right. Looking good. Right, I'm all right. 
We'll show him crossing the coast, land flat. Only we coast. show you crossing the coast now. Uh, yeah. Well, you can come. The shuttle is first sighted at about 100,000 feet with a long-range camera from Anderson Peak, California. What a way to come to California. In flat photo, I still look perfect right on the nominal. Yeah, Roger that, we're looking. Okay, take in figure. Roll reversal to the right. Columbia, we see you coming right, looking good. And here we come back at the 4.8 roll reversal. That's Bakersfield out there. Coming across the hatch key in the, the Sierras. The vehicle sort of rolls rings level, and uh, this is about at 80,000 feet. The uh, tracking data, nav data, and pre-planned trajectory are all one line on our plot boards here. Uh, right away from track. Out of 70,000 feet at Mach 1.8, range 42 miles. Columbia, we show you very slightly high in altitude, coming down nicely, and the FES uh, is to go to off. Mach 1.3 at uh, 58,000 feet. Coming across the lake bed areas that we told you all about, there's uh, China Lake up in that area up in there, and you can see it at the, the left window. There's a cutty back there, Old South Lake coming in the view of the top, right at the top. We're coming out to swing around the heading alignment circle, and uh, it sure is a beautiful view. Looking out that window, you can see everything you need to see. There was just no doubt in our minds that we knew exactly where we were in the flight, even uh, by comparing uh, what we had on our normal ground track with what we're seeing on the instrument. There are three sisters up there. The right end up to this point, uh, it's been nice and smooth, and the vehicle controls really tight. It's uh, nice thing. They take the plane joint up there, and we're uh, getting ready to go in the turn around what we call our heading alignment circle. That's uh, the Mojave River, which is a, mainly a dry lake bed, a dry river bed out there. Uh, John is, in, is driving the vehicle at this this point in time, and, uh, and it really handled nice. We were right down the middle of the corridor all the way. The remarkable thing about the space shuttle is it's all electric, and uh, the, when you move the wings somewhere, they stay there. You put the nose somewhere, and it stays there. It's just, just an admirable handling vehicle. You couldn't ask for anything as, as responsive, and as, uh, for this kind of a job, it does it exactly like you, you want it to. Couldn't have altered a, a better day for coming back in. We could have navigated visually all the way from when we hit the coast, which was just a little less than Mach 7 up above, south of the San Francisco area, all the way down to the San, San Joaquin Valley to the Edwards. There was no problem in knowing where you were at any time. Chase reports no tile or other damage is evident underneath the shuttle. 16,000 feet. Kind of hard to see at first in these films, but there's the old aim point right there. We're starting to come down the glide slope there, and the runway's uh, still hard to see there. We have some uh, aim lights that give you an indication of what your glide slope is out there that we refer to as patchy lights. Uh, we also uh, had locked onto a microwave landing system, and all of those ended up agreeing right on as to where we were, no doubt whatsoever. Here's our old chase plane. He's flying back and forth across the bottom of the vehicle taking pictures uh, to see uh, if there's any tile damage uh, that would not show up. You know, they thought they might get some from the rocks and everything on the desert floor, so he's covering that right now. And Chase Plane did a real terrific job. The vehicle is very easy to control in this flight regime. We're about into pre-flare right now. You know, we're flying about uh, 285 knots at this point, like about a 20-degree glide slope. Without power, Columbia must land. It cannot make another attempt. You may be able to see two or three of those lights. Uh, two lights, two white lights is what we're looking for. There are two there. We start our pull up now and there'll be uh, three. You'll see the third one come on. So we're on a 20 degree glide slope to pre-flare, which means we can only land uh, right down here at the touchdown point. Here's the wheels coming down. The wheels really snap down fast. They much much faster than what I anticipated. And there's a couple of big black marks you'll see coming up here pretty soon. There they are. That's a touchdown point. And here we go, boy. What a machine. They didn't know about that. Supposed to land on the touchdown point. But no, actually. You should understand, John was not trying to touch down on the touchdown point. What we were trying to do was to find out what the real deceleration came and, and touch down about on an airspeed, which was about 185 knots. 
and uh, all of the ALC flights and this one ended up landing landing long, which looks to us like we have uh, a little bit more lift capability than what would have been predicted. Welcome home, we rolled right up here so uh, Kennedy Space Center's uh, recovery team could get a hold of us and hook the cooling up as fast as possible. We rolled into the runway intersection. We did that on purpose, so we hardly used any brakes on this roll out, and there's the vehicle sitting, and she is a beauty. That's, uh, believe it or not, the weight of that vehicle right there is about a little, uh, right around 99 tons. I keep reading where it's uh, 150,000 pounds or 80 tons, but that one right there is 99 tons. It's quite a quite a performance thing to put the return from orbit with 99 ton spacecraft and get her back all in one piece, I think. The maiden voyage of Columbia has been a success. The astronauts and the vehicle have met or exceeded all 144 flight test objectives. This is Mission Control Houston. The unofficial touchdown time, two days, six hours, 20 minutes, 52 seconds. Two days, six hours, 20 minutes, 52 seconds. The Columbia represents an achievement in aerospace technology and development never before realized in the history of manned spaceflight. It is our basic building block for the future. The main question that I've been asked since I got back was, what were you doing jumping around that spacecraft uh, when you uh, got out? Well, I'm proud to say what I was doing. And everyone had said that uh, they had shown, from an engineering statistics standpoint, that it was impossible, impossible, mind you, that some of those critical tiles on the bottom of the vehicle would not fall off. Uh, none of those tiles fell off. Robert and I have spent uh, most of the exciting and interesting uh, two and a half days probably that we ever spent in our lives or may ever spend again. The spaceship Columbia is a, a phenomenon. It is a, an incredibly amazing piece of machinery. And any time you can take something that big and put it into space and bring it back and land it on a runway, you have just accomplished <laughs> something just short of a miracle, I believe. There, there aren't words to express. There aren't words to express just how uh, grateful we are to everybody that did so much to help this mission go successfully. But there are a few people that need special thanks. I think, for example, that my wife Susie put up with me for nine years <laughs> while I was working on this contraption, and uh, the last three while we we're training for it, living, eating, breathing, and sleeping it deserves a thanks. And there's one person in particular that I'd like to thank. Uh, it's uh, Captain Robert Bob Crippen. Now, Bob is a very smart young man, and he also works very hard. And he kept me out of a lot of trouble on that flight. I didn't know where it was. <laughs> When he wants to know the spacecraft, he knows it completely. And there were some uh, moments up there, and uh, in route and coming from up there, where we had some very exciting places where we had to perform very complicated and complex tasks, and Robert did all those things. And uh, <laughs> he did them without, at, he did them with, even ignoring uh, some potential personal risks and I think he did one hell of a job. And, and I'm going to recommend him to be a commander of one of the early space shuttle flights. That's no joke. For me to get a chance to fly with a guy like John Young and for him to come out with words like that, well, <laughs> most of you have to know John to understand that. I was just hanging on, hoping he'd point me in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> most of you standing out here in front of me have done what John and I have been doing for about the past nine years. We've been busting our buns to get the space shuttle up. Well, let me tell you, it was well worth the effort. We've got one fantastic machine. 
and we have given the country one marvelous technological capability. For me personally, it was the darndest time I've ever had in my entire life. And I'm glad to hear John's recommendation because I want to go back as soon as I can. I would, like John, want to acknowledge my wife, Jenny, who put up with a heck of a lot to get me up there. We certainly appreciate y'all coming out here today. Thank you. A revolutionary new era in space transportation has just begun. Routine access to space. Welcome to the future. When we get operational, the space shuttle will be able to do in five to 10 years what it would have taken us 20 to 30 years to do otherwise. 